Welcome to Nobel Prize Conversations. I'm Claire Brilliant, and I'm here with our host, Adam Smith. Hi, Adam. Hello, Claire. So we've been digging through our archives of previously recorded conversations, and today we'll be hearing from John Mather. When did you speak to him, Adam? The conversation was recorded in 2014. He'd been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics back in 2006 for his work on the Kobe satellite and mapping the cosmic microwave background radiation. And in 2014, he was busy with another satellite. (laughs) And I guess he'd had a few years to get used to the prize. Yes, uh, he had indeed. The prize tended not to interfere too much in his work because he's he's very focused and putting together these teams that have to uh, get satellites to actually work, get launched and work in space. I I think that really comes across in in the conversation, uh, you know, the immense task of bringing these huge teams of people together and how dedicated he is to that. Mm. Exactly. He was building the James Webb Space Telescope back in 2014, uh, which now, of course, has been uh, launched and is sitting a million miles from Earth, mapping deep regions of space and revealing all sorts of amazing things. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear him talk about the potential of what he thinks these satellites are going to tell us. Well, absolutely. I mean, the data is coming back now and uh, showing that uh, water in the atmosphere of exoplanets orbiting stars in distant constellations, or or, or indeed the signatures of carbon containing molecules in those atmospheres. And he feels that uh, such signatures will be the footprint of life elsewhere, which he is sure we will eventually find. I I really found it fascinating, his conviction that we will find extraterrestrial life. Mm. I also love his observation that extraterrestrial life may, if it becomes advanced, actually not emit much of a signal that he says, although we beam energy into space all the time, that may be just a stage in our lack of advancement. And once we get past this stage, we might become quieter, if you see what I mean. Fascinating Mm. idea. Mm, Really fascinating. Yes. Well, he says uh, that he can't ever remember not wanting to be a scientist. And you can certainly tell that from listening to him. So let's uh, tune into the episode now. Morning. You've just come back from the Intel Science and Engineering Fair in Los Angeles. Yes, indeed. It was a pretty amazing uh, group of young people there. Uh, <laughs> very inventive, very, very creative, very self-propelled young people. Uh, several of them told me, no, I, they, they did it themselves. Uh, their parents didn't even understand what they had done. So if the world is uh, to be based on what these young people are doing, we're in fine shape. Well, that's the thing, because it, it's in a way, one might associate doing science projects with a sort of old-fashioned approach, and certainly lots of the laureates we speak to did great science projects when they were young. But nowadays, uh, it's really good to hear that young people are still doing science projects in their spare time. Oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, they just want to do these things. Um they think of something, they're inspired, they look things up on the internet, they take online courses, they go far beyond what their school teachers are leading them to do, and, uh, and uh, they're amazing. <laughs> and it's become, a, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's been going a long time, this science fair, but it's becoming a more and more international affair, is that right? Yes, I think they told me there were 1,600 people from 80 countries. Yes, it's indeed huge. Anybody you saw you wanted to recruit? <laughs> Oh, well, there are lots of really smart people there. Um, one of the astronomers that I know was already going to be a summer intern at, at NASA Goddard, where I work. Hmm. And so um, we we certainly recruit bright people occasionally. But um, before that, we're ready to hire them into NASA, we need them to have uh, college degrees mostly. Hmm. Yes, so of course. we're just eager to see what they're going to do next. <laughs> Did you tinker with science projects when you were young? Yeah, I participated some. Um, I know in ninth grade I had a uh, project about uh, uh, nutrition and uh, and rats. Uh, I kept eight baby rats under the table in the kitchen for a, a few weeks while I found out what they did on different kinds of food. Uh, later on, I think in 11th grade, I had a project about trying to measure the orbits of asteroids. And I would say that it was a complete failure, but it was fun to try. Were there any mishaps with your projects, apart from failures, actual disasters? Uh, no, no serious disasters, no. Nobody hurt. <laughs> and were you, were you in a very supportive scientific environment when you were doing these things, or were you out on your own? Well, yes and no. Uh, my dad is a scientist, so he was certainly was encouraging. My mother was encouraging, but uh, 
they didn't know him personally very much about what I wanted to do. Um, well, my dad did teach me statistics in ninth grade. So I learned about analysis of variance from him. Hmm. And uh, that was a good thing to know about. Hmm. Um, my, uh, my other project was asteroid orbits. Now I was definitely on my own. And when you were doing these things, had you already decided that you wanted to become a scientist? I don't know if I ever decided that. I think it's more like I noticed that. I, I can't remember ever not wanting to be a scientist. Really? Even when you were very, very young? Well, I don't remember anything when I was very young. <laughs> but I know uh, around uh, third or fourth grade, I was already um, reading everything I could about science. Gosh, so that's eight or nine years old and you were already... Yeah. yeah. Wow. That must have been pretty unusual. I suppose so, but um, I have no way to tell. <laughs> I would expect that uh, many of the science fair uh, students there uh, also started there where they were eight or nine years old. Can you summarize what it was, what it is, about science that you found and find so fascinating? Well, uh, several things. One is that uh, there's a sense of discovery. Uh, that you can just find out things that nobody knows before. Um, so um, if you find them yourself and you're the first one to find them, that sounds really important. <laughs> and maybe it'll help uh, change the world for the better in some way. Um, there's the idea that it's also a little dangerous. So I grew up on stories of Galileo and Darwin, and uh, um, the fact that they got in trouble just proved to me that it was important. I love the idea of a nine-year-old boy reading about science and thinking of it as a kind of wonderful, dangerous profession. <laughs> well, growing up here in the States where there are so many fundamentalists around uh, and people who would disagree with you uh, if you wanted to tell them about evolution, uh, well, I used to have dreams about that. Suppose I were teaching in school and I was teaching the students about evolution. Well, it wasn't so long ago we had our trial jury trial over here about whether it was okay to teach evolution mm. and um, anyway, we keep on fighting that fight exactly because uh, <laughs> things haven't changed all that much I mean they're not jury trials now but the, but but there's still a big big debate yeah and do you still feel I mean do you feel yourself to be fighting that battle on a, if you like on a daily basis to try and get people to to well actually no I don't fight it on a daily basis I just do what I do and uh I don't think it's my job or anybody's job to try to convince other people of, of the righteousness of my opinion. So I think, well, it's each person's job to figure out how they look at the world. One of the things that you had to have when you eventually came to um, be the lead scientist making sure that the Kobe satellite project actually worked um, was an incredible degree amount of confidence, I would have thought. Um, I actually don't think so. <laughs> um, confidence, um, I think, is the sort of wrong feeling to convey. Um, I think more it's a sense of the importance of the work and the uh, and the determination to make it con to work. So um, rather than confidence, one has to have persistence and uh, determination and uh, certain degree of, uh, of uh, worry. Uh, if you uh, don't worry, then you don't understand how hard the job is. Hmm. So, um, in fact, it's the job of our space engineering experts to make sure that something works. So they have to spend a vast amount of effort to uh, think of everything that could go wrong and make sure that doesn't happen. Hmm. So it's like the opposite of confidence. <laughs> Okay, but when somebody handed you the task um, of pulling all these people together and um, acting as the kind of center point for everybody building Kobe, putting everyone in the same direction, they must have seen in you the sort of person who could inspire confidence in others at least. Yes, I guess they must have. Um, it's hard for me to remember those days because... Uh uh, when I was hired into NASA to uh, to work on this project, uh, I was only 30 years old. Mm. And so I thought, uh, 
they don't have much basis for confidence. It's just I'm willing to stand here and say I'm going to do this project. And so um, they were willing to um, bring in the top talent to, to make it happen. I didn't actually organize all of that. Uh, top engineering management did that. So um, I think what they saw was uh, a young team of scientists with some good ideas, and they thought it was important enough to... Uh, to re recruit the best engineers that they could to make sure that it would happen. So it's much more um, an organizational process with other people's leadership than it is me. Right, and is that in a way the secret of NASA's success, that they're able to organize the right teams of people to make these projects work? Yes, I think so. Uh, well, it's NASA, it's other, every other large organization that succeeds has to have a, a set of people and a, a culture and a process that, that leads to success. Um, if you were to just set one bright person in the middle of the world and say, uh, now build me a telescope, um, it would be a very long time of recruiting the top talent and organizing them to find out who could do what and making sure that things would work. Mm -hmm. um, an organization like NASA or its great contractors, all of them have this uh, uh, collection of people and process at the same time. There's no way we could be building a, a great telescope today just because a few people were smart. It takes this huge crowd of uh, people with history who know how to do things. So when when you finished the project, when Kobe finally delivered, in your case, the evidence that the CMB had a black body form, do you remember the moment of finishing that project, of, it, of the data coming in? Well, um, yes and no. I know um, the... Uh, there are a number of special moments. Uh, one is, of course, the launch. <laughs> and uh, you realize that, uh, no, it did not explode. <laughs> yes. Then yes. Uh, a few hours later, you realize, and uh, signals have come back, and you say, well, it's the satellite's alive. Then um, it takes a few days before we are able to open the cover on the helium cryostat to find out if everything works. Uh, then uh, a few days after that, uh, things are not behaving quite right. So we have to debug and uh, figure out what to do about all that. So um, but within a couple of weeks, I think we were already getting our first interferograms and our first data saying, yes, things are functioning. So I do have somewhere in my uh, uh, keepsakes a uh, signed interferogram where my uh, team members working late into the night were able to, uh, to make a printout that showed the data were coming in correctly. So... That's a special moment. Um, it didn't take too long after that before we realized we could make the uh, famous spectrum that we uh, presented uh, six weeks after launch at the Astronomical Society. Hmm. And so uh, I think when I presented that spectrum and we got a standing ovation for it, I came to understand that it was much more important than I have, had ever guessed. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty special. Then two years later, as you know, we put forward our uh, first maps of the sky. And um, again, uh, it was hugely important to the world and uh, uh, because it was a map that they could print on the front of the newspaper and it was got even more publicity than before. Um, I'd like to, by the way, mention that there was, there was a process leading to that. Um, about six months before that event, uh, Ned Wright, who was a member of our science team, had done his own personal analysis of the microwave uh, map and uh, showed the science team that, yes, it had spots on it. So um, our conclusion was, uh, that's probably right, but we better check it. Mm. So we spent the next six months verifying that it was correct before we could go public with it. So, and, that's, and that six months was important? Yes. Uh, we... Um, we, now, well, there's a history of um, people going off half-cocked in science. Mm. <laughs> uh, the more important it is, the less caref careful they get sometimes. So that was in the days of uh, polywater, which was apparently a fraud, and uh, cold fusion, which was apparently another fraud. Um, so um, we knew for sure we'd better not be announcing something that would have to be retracted. Mm. So that's why we were so careful. When you come to the end of a project like that, and you had lived with the cosmic microwave background radiation for a long time, because of course you'd tried to make a map from balloon-borne experiments prior to you ever mm -hmm. beginning on the satellite project, 
when you come to the end of it, it must be, in a way, very hard to conceive of starting something else. You sort of, <laughs> you finished a major chunk of your life's work. How do you, how do you begin again? Well, that's a that was a tricky question. At the end of the Kobe project, I uh, did indeed think, "What am I going to do now?" And I started poking around at different ideas. I thought for a while, well, maybe um, you know they were planning the Spitzer telescope at the time, and so um, my friend said, "Well, you know, it's not a big enough telescope. We need to make a bigger one." Um, I started making sketches of how you would. Uh, unfold a uh, telescope in outer space. Uh, hmm. I had in mind something uh, only about two meters across, which was about a little over twice what the size of Spitzer Telescope is. So I thought, well, that would be fun. And I presented my ideas to a small colloquium, and my friend said, oh, we'll never do that. That's much too hard. A couple of years after that, I got the phone call from NASA headquarters that it said it's time to start the new telescope, what turned into the James Webb Space Telescope, would I like to participate? And if so, uh, I, they needed a proposal the next day for how to proceed. <laughs> so I thought, I certainly can tell what to do now. <laughs> Did you have your scrap of paper where you had your, your doodles ready? Yeah. So when will the James Webb Space Telescope launch? Uh, it's planned for October-ish 2018. So uh, just over four years from now. Mm-hmm. And we will have the observatory at the launch site. That's the plan. And the launch site will be where? Oh, it's in French Guiana. Right. It's on the equator in South America uh, because the European Space Agency is buying the rocket for this mission, and that's where they launch. Mm -hmm. And how assured is, is that rocket launch? Is there a huge competition for those, or can you really book in advance like that and say this is going to be Oh, uh, yeah, we can book those in advance. Mm -hmm. The... Um, it's a commercial product. Right. Um, they launch them many times a year. I think uh, they have a track record of about 50 in a row good runs. So we're pretty pleased with that. It's about as good as it gets in the space business. Mm -hmm. Do you have a kind of backup plan for if you happen to be the rocket that doesn't that, that does explode? Do, how different? Um, no, we don't even think about that. <laughs> okay. Let's not talk about Better that. Better not yeah. to think about that. <laughs> Just make sure the one that we have does the right thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when it gets into space and becomes functional, what will it see that hasn't been seen before? Ah, well, uh, it's uh, designed to do infrared astronomy, uh, which uh, we accomplish by making the telescope cold so it doesn't emit infrared light itself. Uh, so it's also very large. So it will be able to look much farther out into space and farther back in time to look for the uh, first objects that formed after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. The first stars, the first galaxies, the first black holes, the first supernovae, the first everything, uh, and then try to understand how that led to our existence today. Uh, how, how did the stars uh, explode and uh, the material fall back in to make new generations of stars and planets? Uh, how are stars being formed today? Uh, we know where they're doing it, uh, nearby, and so let's please have a look inside those dust clouds, see them do it, uh, ideally to learn a lot more about planets, uh, planetary systems. Uh, so, for instance, uh, tracking down all the planets that have been discovered by the Kepler, and we're even uh, be developing a NASA mission called TESS, which is a trans transiting exoplanet survey satellite, I think. Anyway, it will... Um, and basically extend the Kepler technique to all the nearest and brightest stars so that uh, with luck we'll have a pretty nearby candidate object that might be like Earth. <laughs> so if we're extremely lucky, then we will find one that has uh, enough water vapor to have an ocean. <laughs> and that would be remarkable. So from the James Webb, you're going to be able to see planets as they transit across their stars and tell whether they have enough water vapor to potentially have oceans. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it is indeed. Well, you know, uh, when we first conceived the telescope, we didn't know that was possible. <laughs> but we've uh, only made the tiniest design changes to make it possible for the telescope to see those things. So do you, is it the case that you have 
a kind of raft of ideas coming in all the time for how you can improve it and what, what else you can add to it, to the mission? Do you have to have a shutdown time at which you say, after this point, no more ideas, let's just do what we're doing? Um, pretty much the scientific uh, requirements were frozen in about 2002. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> hardly any changes have been made since. That's amazing. That's a very long time. What? Why does it have to be set so far ahead of the uh, 2018 launch? Well, of course, in 2002, we didn't think the launch would be in 2018. <laughs> yeah. We thought we had a uh, much shorter time, but um, it was still the correct plan because um, you can't uh, build stuff while you keep changing your mind. So uh, you have to decide what you're going to do. Um, so we did, however, have to uh, continue to demonstrate our technologies. Uh, each uh, We had 10 different things that had to be invented and perfected before we could use them on this observatory. So it took until 2007 before they were even ready to, to trust. So that included things like the mirrors, um, the, uh, the two kinds of infrared detectors that we need, um, a, a very low temperature amplifier, and a computer to run the detectors, um, the ability to unfold the telescope in space and focus it after launch. All of those things had to be understood uh, before you could even finish the design. So um, it's very intimidating. That's a, there's a plenty of good reason why you don't keep changing your mind. Hmm. When people talk about the Apollo missions in the 60s, they look back and they say that it was an unbelievable feat that uh, people, I mean, it happened, but the advancement in technology in the lead up to the moon missions was so great that it was just unlike any kind of invention that had been seen before or, or pace of invention. Is it like that every time you do one of these, that you conceive things that have to be invented to make this project work and it seems incredible when you conceive them that it can be done within the time, but somehow people find the resources to make it happen? Well, I don't know about every time, uh, because every mission is different. Um, we have uh, different requirements, for instance, for uh, studying the Earth than we do for doing astronomy. Hmm. For Earth science, uh, we need to have continuity, where we know that the, uh, the new equipment uh, agrees with the old equipment. It's, uh, measuring trends of the Earth is uh, very, very important. You hmm. want to know if it's getting warmer or colder, uh, wetter or drier, uh, dusty or less dr- dusty. Um, all those things uh, require continuity. So for that uh, territory, uh, sometimes less change is good. Um, and many more of the same kinds of equipment is good. Uh, for astronomy, uh, we push the frontiers by building something that's more powerful than before. And uh, and they're infrequent enough that uh, technology uh, changes a lot in between. So, for instance... Uh, the uh, next even bigger telescope after the James Webb Telescope would probably be uh, built specifically uh, optimized to study those planets around other stars, the exoplanets. So that probably means it needs to be two or three times as large as the James Webb Telescope. Mm. Mm. And uh, when we get to do that, it'll take uh, yet another set of inventions. And do you have to start designing the next one before you've got the current one up and working so that you have to predict what you're going to see from this experiment and use that to design the next experiment without actually knowing whether this one is going to give you what you need? Uh, well, I think actually our, our challenge is a little different. Hmm. Um, the, the, the most uncertain thing about uh, these great telescopes is can we do them? <laughs> um, people are quite uh, concerned about what happens if it doesn't work. Hmm. So I think that's the number one thing to establish, that uh, it's possible for an organization to produce a working product even if it is this complicated. So um, that's, I think, the number one. Um, the setting out the next kind of science to do isn't actually so hard to figure out because uh, we already have good evidence for what it should be. And how do you how do you decide which experiments to do? How do you prioritize and and given the 
vast number of possibilities and whether you're planning, I suppose, whether NASA invests in, oh, space missions or whether they invest in satellite technology. or How, how do you begin to decide? Well, uh, for a particular mission like the James Webb Telescope, uh, we set out uh, committees of scientists to say, well, what's most important to you? Um, what do you think we'll be wanting to do in 10 or 20 or 30 years from now? Um, and how do you know that somebody else isn't going to do it? Hmm. Uh, so we looked for the things that uh, could never be done in any other way. So that uh, sort of basic idea, don't do something somebody else can do. It's too hard and takes too long to put up a space mission. Mm -hmm. So um, we could tell that uh, nobody was going to do this particular science because nobody could see through the Earth's atmosphere um, at the wavelengths that we were working on. Um, and uh, so it had, whatever was progress was going to be done it had to be done with a space mission. So that tells us our idea was unique. Mm. So, um, but that, that's... If you want to say, how do you choose... Uh, what general idea to pursue, what kind of observatory. Yes. Uh, we have uh, giant committees uh, in the U.S. They meet every 10 years, uh, and they produce a survey of all kinds of astronomy uh, and what should be done next. And uh, Europe has its own process for doing those things, and so do uh, uh, individual countries like the U.K. So um, committees of scientists get together and argue. So that's a good thing. Is there a big debate about whether it's better to do missions that have great popular appeal? I suppose searching for exoplanets is a good one as far as the public are concerned, and certainly putting people onto Mars would have um, popular appeal, or projects that are more for the scientists, if you like, where the popular appeal is not quite so obvious. Well, I, I don't know. Um, clearly... Um the public pays for these things uh, through their taxes for large uh, NASA and European uh, missions. Um, if um, if we're sending people to Mars, that uh, probably it may happen differently uh, because it is uh, it uh, takes uh, a different way to go than what we've been thinking about. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, there's a company called SpaceX. Mm. Uh, where the, they've been making good progress on lowering the price of space uh, launches. Hmm. And uh, the company owner, Mr. Elon Musk, says that he's motivated by the desire to go personally to Mars. <laughs> so, um, so that may actually change our whole uh, interplanetary travel process if he's successful. And do you think he will be? Well, he's doing awfully well now. <laughs> uh, and so I encouraged the thought that he can do well. Mm. Uh, uh, travel to Mars is uh, dangerous no matter how you think of it, uh, but um, we can do better, so maybe we will. Did you ever entertain the thought yourself of um, trying to get up into space? Oh, not very much. I'm not, uh, I'm not very much of an athlete. I think I would be a little concerned about surviving the launch. But if I could go safely and comfortably, of course I would want to go. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you um, just one film-related question. Um, having watched Gravity on an aeroplane journey myself the other day, um, is that picture that's portrayed in the film Gravity of a rather crowded near-Earth orbit with the potential of things to bump into each other, satellites to bump into each other, becoming true? Are we getting a bit crowded in the near-Earth space? Well, it is crowded. And we've already had uh, a one uh, definite accident where two satellites collided, and they weren't even trying. They were, they were, there was just a, a random accident. Um, and, of course, that showers the area with debris. Um, we've had a couple of events where uh, satellites were intentionally shot at by, uh, by the people that owned them. Um, one U.S. Uh, to prove the ability to do it, and one Chinese. And um, in both cases, uh, debris occurs. Mm. And uh, this has a, a significant hazard for astronauts. There's more and more and more of this uh, debris up there. So um, it's not imminent, but uh, certainly predictable that there will be a time 
uh, when there's so much debris that you can't go there anymore. So that will happen? There will be such a time? Well, it uh, depends on what people do. We could uh, continue to work on uh, ways of uh, reducing that debris. To go, to, go out and catch it or destroy it or de send it into the atmosphere or various things we could do that would help. Hard to, con hard to conceive. because you, uh, you probably already know that there's an international treaty that requires um, all, and all satellites in those areas to be disposed of safely when they're done. Mm. So uh, but things, bad things still happen. I can't begin to see how you might you might begin to get rid of the debris. Um, you, you, you'd need some sort of vast vacuum cleaner sucking it all up, or...? Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are a lot of ideas, uh, but none have turned out to be very... Uh, none have been chosen yet, I think. Right. But, I mean, presumably it's a very important problem to s solve because otherwise you also can't put satellites up because they're going to bump into the debris okay, every so often. Yeah, so... Um, it's harder than it sounds. Yes, okay. Put it that way. <laughs> yes, quite. So, one of the other things you spoke about, with reference to James Webb, was was that it's going to look further back in time to the very, the earliest, the formation of some of the earliest large large structures in the universe. Um, that's an extraordinary thing to sort of begin to conceive. And I wanted to ask, do you do you stop every so often and just marvel at the wonder of what you're looking at and what you're trying to look at, um, the enormity of it? Uh, I do. Every, every day, <laughs> I'm thinking about the, the marvels of what I'm looking at. Um, and um, to me, the even more mysterious part is the biological world. You know, I've studied physics long enough to have some idea of how these things function and how uh, we're now able to simulate uh, in the computers how galaxies form and things like that, um, how stars form, how planets form. Um, but uh, when I listen to my biologist friends talk about what they're working on, I'm thinking how completely astonishing it all is and how unutterably complex it all is and, uh, and how almost miraculous it seems even when you understand about evolution. Um, there's just no end to the complexity of what we have inside us. <laughs> and uh, to think about the fact that each of us is deep, prob we're probably all descended from the same original single-celled living thing 3.8 billion years ago. And so uh, here we are continuing uh, 3.8 billion years of life. So you and I and the bacteria and the viruses are all direct relatives. <laughs> it's very nicely said, very beautifully said. But one of the, one of the th strange things, perhaps, is that people in general, I would say, are much more grabbed by the wonders of the universe than they are by the wonders of life on Earth. Um, if you look at sort of newspaper headlines, it, as soon as there's a new beautiful picture of the universe or some fact that brings out the enormity of space, it hits headlines and people lap it up. But somehow the marvel of life on Earth is perhaps more mundane, I don't know, to people. They see it, they, they sort of encounter it every day and somehow they're used to it and they don't tend to be as amazed by it, I would say. Uh, I know, that's true. Uh, well, we make beautiful pictures in our astronomy and people are inspired by those pictures. Um, the uh, how, how life works is just much more complex than you could possibly imagine, so it's hard to make a pretty picture of it. Mm. Mm. But, if, but if you know uh, a little bit about it, you say, oh, how, uh, how completely amazing, because life is, more, is uh, in my, far more than I ever knew. It's uh, done digitally. You know, we have... Uh, digital code in our RNA and our DNA. And uh, and the uh, little tiny computer hardware inside each cell, they read the code and do things with it. And so uh, things are switched on and off digitally. Um, nobody gets excited about computer code, <laughs> except maybe the people who write it. We just, uh, all, we just use it. Mm. And without knowing anything about the marvels inside it. Mm. So... Uh, 
like people aren't amazed at the wonderful engineering inside their cars either. But uh, 200 years ago, we didn't have any. And that, that's an equally mysterious and wonderful story. Is there one undiscovered question in space research, in, in astronomy, that you very much hope to see answered in your career? Ah, uh, well, um, I'd say every day when somebody asks me that question, I have a different answer. <laughs> because there are so many wonderful mysteries out there. I'll just say a few that uh, are really intriguing, and there's a chance that we can make some good progress. What are the dark matter and the dark energy? Um, there's a fair chance that we can have a reaction of some kind of dark matter in a laboratory setting, um, and there are several experiments worldwide hunting for that. So maybe we'll know more about the dark matter, and maybe we'll finally get a uh, satisfactory unifying uh, theory of physics that says what it is and what it's supposed to be and makes some decent predictions. Um, that would help. Um, the uh, closer to home, um, are we the only ones here in the universe? Or is this planet the only one that's alive? Or are there many planets that are alive? Hmm. So um, I, I'll tell you my prediction is that uh, wherever there's liquid water, um, there's life. Mm -hmm. That's my think, what I think. Right. And how would we know? Well, we have to go a few places where you can examine this. So on Mars, there uh, at least was and probably still is liquid water in places. So I think um, when we dig carefully and well, we will discover signs of life on Mars. Let me just... Uh, so we know we can get there with the equipment to do that. So let me just explore that question a little bit more. So where where will the liquid water be on Mars, do you think? Well, it's not on the surface because it, uh, it's too cold and too dry. But underground, there could be liquid water in the rock. Mm -hmm. And when do you think it is likely that we might be able to get to that place? Oh, well, that's pretty hard. Um, it depends on how far down into the rock you think you might have to drill or whether you think uh, some signs of it will be on the surface. Mm. So I think we have to send a continuing series of probes to uh, to go looking around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, chemistry labs on the surface of Mars now. In fact, um, one of them was built right here at Goddard Space Flight Center, and my colleagues are every day uh, rehearsing in their lab in, in Greenbelt, Maryland, how to do the analysis on Mars. So um, there will be a uh, continuing series of uh, miniaturized instruments to go to Mars to do these analyses. Another great hope that the team has there is to uh, please bring back some rocks so we can study them here at home <laughs> with even more powerful equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, bringing rocks home, that clearly a, a major job. Mm. Uh, it's difficult and expensive also, but it's still not nearly as difficult and expensive as uh, getting people to Mars and back. Mm. Mm. So um, I think it's clearly a next step in our, uh, in our travel plan to Mars is to uh, learn how to go there with robots and bring back rocks for study. Mm -hmm. and, and now, sorry, now that we're on this topic of um, extraterrestrial life, and given that you surely expect to find liquid water on innumerable planets in time, and thus there are innumerable points in the universe where there is life, do you think it's odd that there has been no sign of that life seen in, in emissions that we've been looking for in space? No, I don't think it's odd. I think it is what I would expect. Right. Um, there's no particular reason for a, uh, a civilization to be transmitting large amounts of, uh, of radio power out into space. Um, we do it here on Earth uh, sort of by accident. Uh, we need radars. We have televisions. Uh, but um, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if in another century that we abandon all that stuff because there's some other better way to do it. <laughs> so... Um, 
<laughs> I think it's quite possible that if there are civilizations out there um, uh, carrying on a high technology civilization, that they don't, there's no reason for them to be sending us a signal. <laughs> yes, it's very hard to think of things in, in any other way than the way you live, isn't it? So. I suppose yeah. Yeah, all future predictions sort of see us going on just as we are, but we won't be, no. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I, I think space is also very large, and so um, I think that it, there's a suggestion here that even if life is common, that uh, intelligent life is not common. Mm. Um, it's, the, the evidence that we have here on Earth is that uh, very soon after the asteroid bombardment ended, uh, about 3.8 billion years ago, uh, we got signs of uh, life in the fossils. So probably it was very quick here after life could occur with liquid water that we um, we had it. Mm. So um, that says a formation of life is quick, but then it took the rest of history for us to get here. Mm. So we modern civilization has only been here, maybe you call it 100 years, where we could transmit radio power. Uh, which out of uh, the age of the universe is just like nothing. Mm -hmm. So um, we are, we're so new and so brief here, it's hard to tell where we can go or what we will do. Yes, it's a good point that, what is it? So it's, um, is it three and a half billion years since life first began on Earth, perhaps? Yeah. Um, and so is that, how would that compare to the normal time that it would take an intelligent civilization to occur on any planet? And how long do planets normally have before something right, happens? Right, good question. Well, one doesn't know. We have our only one th case that we've noticed, which is ourselves. Yes. And uh, there are many serious uh, writers who think that our case is rare. Mm. There's a book called Rare Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes the case for that, and that's not the only one. Um, I think they're probably right that the uh, history of events here on the surface of the Earth is unusual. We have um, a particularly unusual situation with a large moon, which stabilizes the, the spin axis of the Earth. Um, we have volcanism um, and, uh, and continental drift, and just the right amount of water to have both land and ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, those might all be necessary for the formation of uh, intelligent life. So we don't know. But what if all those are necessary? Then it would be rare. Yeah. But do you think you might see extraterrestrial life on Mars um, in your lifetime? I think quite so. I think we could. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. <laughs> um, because Mars is large. If you were to set down a probe in the desert here on Earth, you might have a hard time discovering that there was something underground that was alive here. Yes, too. yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and each probe can only examine a few square meters of territory at best out of uh, millions of square kilometers. So you know, if you don't find it the first time, it doesn't mean there's none. Mm. It just means you didn't find it. Well, I suppose every scientist likes to point out how um, each time you ask a question, the answer just leads to more questions. No, it couldn't be more true in the case of astronomy and space exploration and cosmology. Certainly true, absolutely. <laughs> but that's one of the, uh, one of the great uh, marvels of science, too, is that uh, when you see a little farther, you see that everything is more complex. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, a fair guide to science to figure everything is more complex than you can possibly imagine. And if you can just peel off another layer, um, you'll have more work to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great advertisement for a career in science, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, our, our job is not going to be done anytime soon. <laughs> Good. Well, what a, what a fascinating conversation, at least for me. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I, I love talking with you. Thank you so much. This podcast was presented by Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about John Mather, you can go to nobelprize.org 
where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for Nobel Prize Talks was Magnus Ullier. The editorial team for this encore production includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. You can find previous seasons and conversations on Acast or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.